The Mavericks exit interviews are in the books, and today we're going to be talking about the biggest takeaways from what was a disappointing end to an otherwise mixed bag of a season, shall we say. One of the biggest takeaways from the exit interviews was pending Mavs free agent Tim Hardaway Jr. Now Hardaway opted into his player option this past year and took his shot at a bigger payday down the road. I thought given the year before that he had already had a strong finish to that, that he was more likely to try and cash in then, but he did opt into this player option. He played out a largely up and down season but he ended the season red hot i almost said white hot but he did cool off considerably in the last five quarters of the season unfortunately he went through the first three quarters of game six and was utter brilliant other than luka Doncic, he was the best player on the mavericks in this series and that came apart in the fourth quarter when the rim seemed to shrink on hardaway and the rest of the Mavericks, to be fair, but shrank in that fourth quarter of game six when they had a chance to put Kawhi Leonard and the Clippers away. Instead, he came out then in game seven, was one of nine from three, and largely couldn't make anything. This is the quintessential Tim Hardaway Jr. experience. He is a streaky scorer. He's a guy who, when he's hitting, he fires on all cylinders and he will shoot the lights out at the American Airlines Center or wherever they happen to be playing in that game. But when he's off, he will be a detriment. He's a guy that will look for his shot. He is an aggressive score first shooting guard, go figure. But unfortunately in a case like this, you will get those bad games with Tim Hardaway Jr. That said, the Mavericks have made it clear they want and intend to retain Tim Hardaway Jr. in this offseason, and they believe that they can do it. So first and foremost, the question is, given his moving in and out of the starting lineup this year, given the fact that he's due for a big payday, possibly bigger than even the Mavericks want to pay, what are Tim Hardaway Jr.'s thoughts regarding probably the last major free agency of his NBA career? Yeah, well, first and foremost, just want to take the time out and just thank, you know, everyone that's involved you know, with the success that not only myself had, I had, but with the team success and making it to the playoffs and and um, just going out there and competing each and every day. So I uh, just want to thank everybody from top to bottom. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't really had any talks, uh, just really, really focusing on being around my teammates, being with my teammates, going out there competing uh, each and every day whether it's practice or in the game. And, and uh, you know, that's what agents are for. So I'm just want to take this time to reflect on everything, relax, uh, take my mind off of basketball off just for a little bit and uh, come back to that topic. Tim McMahon. Staying on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> you knew we were gonna let you off that. I know, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, look, you, you, you clearly have established yourself as an, an essential part uh, of this core. Money is important. We all understand that. Uh, how do you feel about a potential fit going forward, and, and how much does fit factor into uh, decision-making this summer for you? I mean, everybody, I mean, if you were to talk to anybody in this organization and, and anybody that's around me, a hundred, uh, every single day, all the time, uh, they would definitely say that um, I love it here. Um, regardless of if I was coming off the bench or if I was starting, uh, uh, I really felt like this was home for me. And I really felt like I created a niche for myself here uh, to be a part of something uh, bigger, bigger than myself. So 
Um, I just wanted to just go out there and just give that tenacity, give that energy, give that effort you know, for the fans. And that's who I play for, I play for them, play for my family, and I play for the love of the game. So, um, but like I said, if, if you were to talk to anybody that's around me 24 seven, they would know that uh, I love it here in Dallas. So with that being said, we can take away a few things here. One, Tim Hardaway Jr. doesn't just like Dallas, he called it home. He says that he has formed a niche for himself here in this city, in this organization, and that it seems pretty clear this is where he wants to stay. Now, part of that could also come from the fact that Dallas could give him more money than anyone else if they were willing to max, but I don't think that they're going to do that. That would be more than a little crazy. Again, you can want to keep a guy and be willing to pay him handsomely, but it doesn't mean that because you have the most money you could offer that you're inherently going to. And so for Tim Hardaway Jr., I think he's making, he's very well spoken here. He's making it clear his desire to stay in Dallas and the fact that regardless of where he's been used, he's done everything asked of him and he's performed well, be it off the bench or in the starting lineup. And it's really something that's just going to come down to what is the contract that the Mavericks are willing to offer him? Because while I think it would be good to bring Tim Hardaway Jr. back, I think he's certainly played well enough to deserve it. I hesitate to use too much of the cap flexibility that the team has on bringing Hardaway back. This cannot be as previous off seasons have been just a simple matter of we like our guys let's run it back Dallas needs substantial upgrades and I'm all for bringing Hardaway back if the numbers are right so we'll see what ends up happening with that we were given a little bit of extra insight as well regarding how he feels about starting I mean if I were to look back in the season I think being a starter I, I, that's where I'm more comfortable at you know, uh, I think I've shown that this year, throughout the year, and um, that's why I'm gonna try to look look forward to it in in in, in the near future. Um, so I feel like I I think I made my niche as a starting as a starting a shooting guard, small forward, whatever they got me listed at. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think I've created that niche that I that I am a starter. There's no mystery here. Hardaway prefers being a starter in the game. He feels it gives him a better feel for things. But again, it also comes down to what is more beneficial to him in free agency. Starters get paid more. If he enters free agency with the label of starting talent, he will more than likely get more money than he could coming off the bench. And if, as far as fit, which is also something that was discussed here. It's one of those things that there might be other teams, better teams that can utilize his talents, but the combination of fit plus money and willingness to pay him said money probably all best culminates in Dallas. So Hardaway Jr. here, I think he played this very well. I thought he gave thoughtful answers that made clear his intentions without coming off as standoffish in any kind of way. It's the least surprising answer I think you could have gotten from him, other than just flat out saying, I have no intention of leaving, which I think in that case, you run the risk then of like, if the team does offer you money and you leave because you don't like the offer, then you've kind of put yourself in a situation where you look like you're the disingenuous one. And not saying that's what's going to happen, but that is something that I thought he navigated as well as you could, giving a kind of people pleaser answer to the local media and to the fan base without promising anything. Next, we roll into the subject of Luka Doncic, and there is a lot here. He didn't talk for very long, but there are a lot of, as you would guess, important things that come up here. How do you feel like your career has progressed so far and does it compare at all to how you grew and eventually became a champion in Europe? Uh, 
I mean, not really, no. I think I'm playing better here than before in New York League. But, you know, it's been great three years. Uh, for me, just living a dream every day, you know, in playing the NBA. And it's fun for me. Callie? Luka, I think you had mentioned on the radio a few weeks ago your plans to play with Slovenia this summer um, the Olympic qualifiers. So I just wanted to see if, if that was still the plan and what your thoughts are, um, you know, heading into a possible Olympic berth. Yeah, this is my next goal, you know, I've qualified with Slovenia for the, for the Olympics, you know, uh, I'm going to be heading back to Slovenia and start practicing, so no, no vacations. Uh, Tim McMahon. Look, there, there's always going to be a lot of focus on the dynamic between you and Porzingis and, and that fit. How, how do you feel about that fit to this point and uh, about that partnership moving forward? I mean, he's great, you know, uh, he's a great player. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do next year with the whole roster, you know, I think we have some couple of free agents, you know, in NBA, uh, every year you have new teammates. So I don't know what's going to happen, uh, but he's a great player. I think we got to use him more and that's it. Um, Skyler. Okay. You'll be eligible, assuming the All NBA thing works out. You'll be eligible for the rookie supermax extension. Is, is that something you intend on signing? Does that go without saying? Uh, I think you know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Dealer's I'm, choice, Skyler. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie to you. I think you know the answer. Uh, Tim Cato. Hey, Luca, I think, I think headed into last offseason, you said you were planning to work on everything to improve everything, uh, but, but you obviously came back noticeably with, the, with that mid-range jump shot that you used you know, throughout the year to, to great effect. Anything specifically you think that, that this offseason is going to bring for you in, in terms of focus on, on development? Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I think, I mean, I don't know if there's going to be a lot of individual work because I got to go back and start practicing with the national team. And then I think it depends if we qualify or not. But obviously, there's a lot to work. You know, you can work even in the practices. So I don't know yet, but uh, obviously free throws. Uh, I got to, I think it's a mental, mental thing too. So I got to be way better than that. The first that stood out to me and Luca had alluded to this in a in a radio interview, I believe it was, a few weeks back. Luca will be playing this summer for Slovenia as they attempt to qualify for the Olympics. So there is no real rest for Luca, which sends up an immediate red flag, but at the same time, I think you can navigate this. You have guys do this every year you know, NBA players go back and play for their home countries for the Olympics or for the FIBA World Cup. You have this happen. And so with that being the case, I think that there's actually a good way you can look at this. You can view this as Luca is going back and he's staying in shape. Like he's not, that was one of the big criticisms this past off season is that Luca came into the season clearly not in the same shape that he was finished the bubble in. Now a lot of that had to stem from the fact that there was initially a belief that the season was going to resume in early to mid-January. It started about four to six weeks earlier than that, and I think Carlisle brought that up as well. It came back way earlier than anticipated, and that had an impact on Luca. He was not able to get ready in the time he had allotted and whether you want to say that was just mismanagement of his planning and preparation, that's a different discussion. But the point is, that shouldn't be a problem here as he goes and immediately heads to Slovenia to rejoin the national team. He will be practicing and attempting to qualify for an Olympic berth in that regard. So he's going to keep working. As he put it, there will be no vacation. It's an important thing to consider then I think that's one of the next big steps for him is really, really making sure he starts the season in optimal shape, that he's good to go and it doesn't take a few weeks or a month or two even to really ramp it up and get going at that MVP caliber level that we know that he can obviously play at at this point.
He then went to talk about his fit alongside Kristaps Porzingis. And again, I thought he had a good answer here. He doesn't, it's, it's not a full embrace of like, look, this is my dude. This is who I'm riding with or anything like that. But he does say KP is a great player and we've got to do a better job of getting him involved. That's great. But what people point to, I think, in the quote that was kind of taken out of context here is when he's asked about KP's future, he basically says, you know, uh, I don't know, in the NBA, you have new teammates every year, so I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I get why that would be his answer. It's correct, but the fact that the quote was kind of snipped in a, in a way that made it sound like, oh, I don't know, brush off answer, next question which sounds like the opposite of him voicing support for his teammate. I think that was kind of misrepresented in Go Figure uh, that was run with by, I think Clutch Points was the one who took that quote where in any other circumstance when you're quoting an athlete or a source, if, they're get, if they say uh or um, particularly when English isn't their first language, you don't include those in the quote. But instead, they have his answer where it leads off with the ellipses suggesting pause, which could also imply just, hey, the part of the quote relevant to the subject is this little bit, then there's a little bit you don't need, and then there's the actual full support and accreditation of that comment. Instead, they have initial word, ellipses, uh, so it really, it paints a picture where Luca basically was asked about KP's future with the Mavericks, started to give an answer, paused awkwardly, and then really thought about it. it basically made it sound like the opposite. Like, mm, I'm trying to really show how I'm being careful with my words as I give the opposite of a vote of confidence. But when you hear the full context here, I think it's a neutral statement. And I think even in the regard of KP still being a Maverick, he's putting his support in that category saying he's a great player we've got to do a better job of getting him involved and i think that is about the the primary answer about the most likely answer that you could expect given the circumstances so that's that's a frustrating thing to me as well uh it, it's just a matter of what the fit is and how they best utilize it a surprise to nobody, he is planning to sign his Supermax, assuming the All-NBA team thing uh, goes that way, which should. He'll be eligible for a $200 million rookie extension. That is insane. Like, that is crazy high value. That said, the dude deserves it because you've been paying him so little compared to what his worth is. He is a top five player in the NBA at this point, top five player in the world in general. If, uh, if you want to look at it in terms of, you know, superstar power and what he means to his franchise, he deserves much bigger money. To put it in perspective, Skip Bayless makes more money right now doing Undisputed than Luka did this year, I believe. I mean, that's, that's so ridiculous. Now, here are some numbers for that. Luca signing that extension this summer, this is what the cap will look like for him. His cap hit the next five years of this deal. Next season, he will make $8.8 .8 million. 2022-2023 is when it gets up a notch, shall we say. In 2022-2023, he will make $34.7 million. The following year, $37.5 million. The following year, $40.3 million. The following year, $43.1 million and it caps off in 2026-27 with a 45.9 million dollar uh, cap hit. Now, that is that is a very large contract for sure. I believe Luca is the first rookie extension to ever hit 200 million dollar uh, span in, in its total multitude. But with that being said, it's easily a contract he's worth. If you don't think he's worth that contract, then you have no idea what you're talking about anyway. Furthermore, 
it's a guy who is indispensable from this team. If you take Luka off this team, you can have KP, he can be option one. If you take Luka off this team, this is, not only is this a lottery team, this is a team that struggles to win more than 23 games. Like, that's probably just the reality of it. Maybe they get to 30 if KP is having a really good year, but Luka, he does too much for this team. He's too indispensable to this roster, and that showed out even in Game 7 where you saw Luka score, what, he scored or assisted on like 71 of the team, excuse me, here it is right here from ESPN Stats and Info. In Game 7, Luka Doncic scored or assisted on 77 points on Sunday, the most in Game 7 history. Nobody has ever done that. He is everything to this team and how it runs. Now, you can certainly fairly say, dude, his usage is too high. They need to get him help so that he doesn't have to do too much. That is entirely fair, and I agree with you 100%. But the fact remains, he does everything for this team. He is the straw that mixes the drink. He is the fuel in the tank. He is the engine that runs the car. Everything hinges on Luka. He is easily worth that contract. And the way that these contracts get bigger and bigger by the year anyway, it won't be long before you have even more guys making that kind of money. So just something to keep an eye out on. Luka Doncic is going to get paid. And I liked, as I said before, him voicing his support for KP. I don't like the way that his quote was kind of twisted by certain outlets. I, I know I mentioned clutch points, but they weren't the only one that did it. Uh, it felt very much like it was almost a, a shot at KP, almost like a, ah, you know, I can't really say that I don't support him or that I don't want to, you know, have his back as he's facing this uncertainty or anything like that. But I'm going to try to walk this line, even though the way I'm answering it makes it clear that I don't support it. I don't see that at all with this. What I see with this is him giving a straightforward answer that does voice support, but is still tepid. I think it's fair to say that. I think it's fair to say he does believe KP is a great player, and he does make a valid point that rosters change every year. You don't know what you're going to have. And the fact that he does pull up a little short of saying like, you know, this is, this is the fit, this is my running mate, this is who I want to have as uh, my co-star moving forward. He doesn't say that, but again, that doesn't really sound like how Luca talks anyway. We might hear certain things like that from other NBA stars, but we don't hear it from Luca, and that's just not his style, I don't think. So I think, uh, I think there's a lot to take in here. Him obviously playing with the Slovenian national team means that he will stay in shape, and the Mavericks are going to try to manage that as best they can as far as still getting him key rest, depending on if they qualify or not. You know, he'll have even less rest. So they're going to have to carefully manage his offseason rest and make sure that his body, which has already worn down a bit, especially towards the end of the season, you saw he was physically drained but still putting out incredible numbers. They need to make sure they manage that so that he is in optimal shape starting the year, which he has not yet done in his NBA career, I don't think, started the season in tremendous shape. And they need to make sure that they can build around him to lessen that burden. My next big takeaway comes from Mavericks coach Rick Carlisle. Now, he talked a little bit about what the Mavericks are going to be looking for in the summer. He talks about a rugged defender who can be a dead-eye shooter and make simple plays off the dribble. This is a pretty clear need for Dallas. And he talks as well about Luka, again, playing for the Slovenian team. But he has some interesting notes that didn't come up when Luka was there. Heard that? Yeah, we spoke to him about that today. And uh, we're, <clears throat> we're helping him set up a schedule so that he can get um, a bit of rest before entering the uh, training camp in, in Slovenia with the Slovenian national team. Um, you know, we're going to have some people over there with him. Uh, I'm going to go over for a few days uh, during training camp. Donnie Nelson's going to be over there. Casey Smith is going to be over there. 
um, you know, to support him and, uh, and, and to watch what they do with the, with the Slovenian national team. I'm, I'm going to be very interested to, to see that. But, uh, you know, Luke has got a, a very good feel for um, his own body, even at the young age of 22. Um, he's been through a lot of games. And, uh, and, 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 and what's not a very short career, really, if you go back to him turning pro at age 13. And he'll feel his way through this. And, uh, and, I, and, and, and I think, in the, you know, in the end, this, this will end up being a positive thing. He, he's always had great experiences with their national team. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm confident that this will be another one. So the Mavericks are going over there. Rather, Rick Carlisle, GM Donnie Nelson, and including head athletic trainer Casey Smith will be going to Slovenia as well during the training camp for the Slovenian national team to kind of keep an eye on things. They're there to support Luka, yes, but I think they're also there to kind of be consultants in a way. Like they're, they're there to keep an eye on exactly how things are progressing with Luka. And if there's any kind of risk to the Mavericks investment, I think they might still be willing to kind of speak up. I don't think they're there purely in a spectator standpoint, but at the same time, I don't think they want to, they're not gonna tell Luca no, that he can't do it. Like, and it wouldn't go over well if they tried to, but they have to figure out how to properly walk that line. And it helps to have Casey Smith, a renowned athletic trainer on hand for your superstar. Because if Luca, the good side of him going and playing for Slovenia is that the concerns about him coming back from the off season out of shape unfounded if that happens you won't have to worry about that and that would be a change in development from the previous years of Luca's career in the NBA where he took about a month to really get going and it impacted him in that way so if you're going to not have to worry about that now it becomes a balance of you might be 22 but you do need some rest and they're going to go in there basically and say we're going to try and manage your workload as much as possible, make sure that it's managed, and then we're going to try and strategically plan out your rest for when you're not actively playing. And if Slovenia qualifies for the Olympics, that's just longer that he's going to be playing and more games that he's putting on himself in the offseason for the NBA. So I think Dallas is just kind of trying to keep an eye out. And I think this also is important because it keeps that connection there. If Luca and... Rick Carlisle are a marriage of sorts. This is a way to kind of keep things a little bit more even because we've seen how they're both competitors. They can bark on the sideline at each other or in timeouts. Uh, obviously, one thing people point to in game six, the last time the Maver Mavericks surged ahead in that game, Carlisle took a timeout that was pretty ill-advised, I thought, and Luca basically screaming, we don't need to call an effing timeout there. And... LA is allowed to make an adjustment, get a defensive liability off the floor that Dallas was attacking. And, you know, the game turned on the on its head at that point. So it's one of those things where if Rick is the guy and we're told that he is, then we need to try and make sure these two are on the same page moving forward. So interesting to see that Dallas is going to be keeping a close eye on Luka as he goes and plays for his national team. I don't know that I've heard of a situation where a team has sent its trainers and its coach and GM to follow a guy playing for his national team in the offseason, but here we are. This last clip, uh, I almost didn't include, but I want to have it in here because I've already referenced it. Carlisle talking about the need for Dallas to have a rugged defender with a dead-eye shooter mentality and able to make simple plays off the bounce. I wanted to actually have that clip just so you had the full context of it, even though I've already kind of discussed it. So it's about a minute long. I'm just going to throw it out here now. I heard Adam Silver say one time, big challenges are solved in small steps. And, you know, we've got to take care of, um, you know, getting our guys healthy, which I mentioned. You know, we got Tim Hardaway, who's a free agent. And I think Donnie probably said that you know, getting him signed is is a is a priority. Um, you know, guys that that complement Luca 
would be uh, rugged defenders. You know, it'd be great to find a, a rugged <clears throat> defender who um, who was a dead eye shooter and could 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 make you know make some simple plays. Um, and look, our eyes are always open, and we have some young guys that are developing too. And so, um, I think those are all realistic avenues. Um, you know, as we get into free agency and and everything, I, you know, we're going to have some cap space. Um, so there will be some opportunities to, to do some things with the roster. Uh, but some of that's going to be a wait and see. Um, but uh, I know that uh, I know that he's excited to get a little bit of rest here. Um, I know that he's enthusiastic about playing with the national team. And then, you know, being able to have a, a, a quote unquote conventional summer of being able to prepare for training camp. So why would this be a big takeaway for me? Not because it's telegraphing the type of player that they need, because we already kind of knew that, but it's more so the conversation of, do they not already have this type of player on the roster? Because they definitely thought acquiring Kristaps Porzingis would address some of these things. Now, the rugged defender, he was known as a premier rim protector. Now the game has kind of evolved where that's not really you're not really able to drop back your center because of how opposing teams now attack you. And that's been something that KP has struggled with. He struggled in the first four games of this series with that, which Carlisle would go on to talk about later. So dead eye shooter, rugged defender, those don't check the box anymore. KP worked a lot more in the low posts back in New York. That has kind of gone away as well. So KP went from on paper being a perfect fit to not really checking those boxes, maybe checking one of them if you want to talk about the shooting, but that's really it. And so there's something to be taken in this of like, we tried to address this and now we see that there's a greater need for it. But he wasn't going out of his way to throw by any means KP under the bus here because he actually did talk as well about what he thinks the team needs and what KP needs to give the team moving forward. A lot of that stems from health. Carlisle, just like after Game 7, went out of his way to talk about how towards the end of the season, KP was the healthiest he had really seen him all year in terms of his ability to move, his ability to move his feet defensively and not be so stationary, his ability to cut to the basket and make plays happen. That was significantly better the final three games. The problem was that he was not the same kind of athletic uh, vertical KP that we saw in the bubble. He didn't have that form. He clearly was not at that same level. And whether or not that's more a factor of the off season being so short and him coming back off yet another knee surgery and the condensed schedule never allowing him to kind of get his feet under him, whether that was just an anomaly of a year where the scenario, the stars were never in alignment for it to be a better year from KP, for him to be more than essentially a glorified role player, or whether there's an actual regression that has to be addressed. The first couple months of the season, KP was the worst defender in the NBA because he couldn't move. He, he was like Dirk at the very end trying to guard on the perimeter. It was painful. And that was just the nature of it. But he got better as the season went on. And even though the offensive game was never there, and even though the involvement was never there, I still feel like he can be better. Whether he can be bubble KP or even last January to March KP, that's a different discussion. But the KP that we saw at the end of the year is not the ceiling moving forward, I feel. Well... Number one, KP's health is the, is the biggest thing. And as I said yesterday, I, I really felt as this series ended that his legs were as strong as we'd seen them. Um, his movement patterns were as positive as we'd seen them. His defense uh, in those three games was um, the best that we'd seen. And, you know, what we're getting into um, in, the in the evolution of today's NBA, we're getting into 
you know, a, a different um, style of defense. It's not like you can just put your seven foot three guy on the five man and play drop coverage and let him protect the rim. You know, now now teams are putting, you know, five skill players out there that can stretch the floor. And, you know, in the first few games, they, they were um, bringing, bringing his guy up and, and lining him up and, 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 and trying to attack him downhill. Um, he adjusted well as the series went on. And, and as, I, as I mentioned, in the last three games, um, did, a, did a really solid job with it. And so I think he's realizing that, you know, the job description um, defensively is, is changing. And, uh, you know, he acknowledged that in our meeting. I don't know if he talked to you guys about that or any of the, any of the other things that we spoke about, but um, that's another reality. Uh, he's a very unique player. And, you know, I, I just think that there are, there are so many things that he can do at 7-3 that, that, you know, very few guys in the history of the game that I've ever seen can do. we got to keep studying our offense. Um, in ways to bring more of those positive things out. But truthfully, you know, the defensive end um, is a big key. And, and, and really, the other, the other part of this, if you look at stretches of games, uh, parts of last season and this season, when Luke and KP had played together and had a chance to get a rhythm over a period of time, they've always cycled up um, in a very positive way. And so... You know, as we enter the summer and, you know, look forward to a productive summer for all our guys and, you know, training camp, which will be here before we know it, um, you know, a fresh start, good health um, are very important things. So what do we take away here? I think this is good insight from Rick Carlisle talking about KP. He still speaks very highly of KP. But you do have to question as well a little bit if there is a potential that Dallas is looking to move Porzingis in the offseason, then he's not going to go out there and say, yeah, you know, we had higher expectations for this. We thought it was going to work out. It hasn't. Now we're going to have to try something different or see if we just have to figure out a way to recoup value. They're not going to say that. Rick isn't going to go out there and say that. And he's more professional than that anyway. I will say with regard to towards the end of the season, particularly the playoffs there, even though he praised KP for his improvements defensively and his effort and his movement without the ball at times, it's also true that towards the end of Dennis Smith Jr., who KP was acquired in exchange for, towards the end of his tenure, Carlisle completely changed how he was using him, took him from the sub, uh, the co-star role dropped him down to just a nice role player and basically determined that he had given up on the experiment. That sort of rang true with this vibe here because you saw the way they were using him or rather not using him clearly indicate that he was just a, a front court player out there for them by that point. Whether or not Carlisle has forevermore lost his faith and trust in KP and what he could be or it was just the the understanding that, you know, you're improving and that's great and I'm praising you for that, but at the same time, I know you're not bubble KP right now. I can't go to you in this situation and continue to feed you, even though we desperately need someone that can help Luca out and not put so much weight and burden on him. It's hard to say whether or not this is a temporary status or if this is just the new norm. But if you go off of the comments from, and this actually came out today, this is not from the exit interviews. This was Donnie Nelson today on 105.3 The Fan talking about Kristaps Porzingis and whether or not the Mavericks will look to trade him this summer. He said, quote, we like the fit. There's no question he's had to alter his game. From what his existence was in New York to now, we like the direction he's going. We've got to do a little bit better job incorporating him, end quote. We'll get into Donnie Nelson and his quotes as it pertained to KP and even Luca here in a bit. But this indicates if that's the case, 
it to me signals that Dallas isn't going to look to move KP for a bag of beans and a promise of maybe something works out. I think they're going to basically chalk this up as we're going to try and reconstruct the roster around these guys as best we can without completely upsetting the apple, apple cart, as it were. And we're going to hope that KP, with a full off season, his first in three years, a full off season, can come back better from this and that we can figure out, we being the Mavericks, we being Rick, we being Luca, how we can better incorporate him into the offense to let him reach his highest heights. We move next into the subject of Kristaps Porzingis, specifically coming from the man himself. Now in this interview, KP gave some insight into his struggles, his frustrations with this, and he talks about not just the difficulty of the previous short off season and coming off the knee, he talks about kind of in general finding his place with the Mavericks and in today's NBA because the looks he gets in New York are nothing like the looks he gets now. And a lot of that is just the evolution of the league and it forces him to grow in new ways, which he himself acknowledges. And he gives good insight as always. So I'm gonna roll that clip for you and then I'll elaborate. Thanks for your time. Um, kind of going on to that, this is at least the first healthy offseason for you in a while. In what ways do you expect that to make a difference? Like, what specifically, um, you know, will you plan to work on or will you plan to do that you haven't been able to do in the last few offseasons? Yeah. yeah, just a lot of a lot of physical work and also combine that with a lot of basketball work, you know. So so I um, I remember coming back when I came back from the ACL a couple, couple seasons ago, you know, I was physically, I was really good, but then the basketball aspect was, you know, and also just coming back from being out for, I don't know, 16 or 18 months that I was out, you know, you're rusty and playing on a new team with different teammates and all that. So all those things played a part and and it wasn't easy, you know, especially feeling the way I was feeling kind of real strong and stiff and not not the last time I remembered when I played almost. It was weird. Um, so that was a big difference. And, and, uh, and after that, I was kind of a little bit like, like, Hold on, let me make sure I feel good on the court basketball wise because at the end if I can't make a shot but I'm I look good and I'm strong, I'm I'm I still can't do the things that I, I expect myself to do, you know. Uh and I learned from that and and I understand now how important are doing both of those at the same time where uh making sure I, I, I'm getting better physically but then also raising, you know, my basketball workouts with with each time that I lift, you know, get some shots up, make sure my shot is feeling good and and, and and then you know once I combine those two things, I think you know that could that could really raise the low, level for me. Tim McMahon. Thank you. Hey, Pete, it's, you know you say yesterday you, you do what the coach is asking you, and you know, I understand that it, accept in a role. What can you do, or you know what has to happen for you to maybe be in a, a more featured role uh, offensively on a on a regular basis? Uh, just keep working on my game, being more, more, the most effective I can. You know, the game's evolving, and um, and you know, the way we're playing, the way I was playing, for example, in New York, where you know a lot of post ups, barely any teams do those kind of things anymore. So my game also has to evolve, and and uh, I have to find ways how I can be effective. You know, which you know I've obviously started to shoot more threes and and and, and stretch the floor for my teammates. But also there's, you know, um, uh, different things that I could do better. And, and that's what I'm going to focus on and, and, and work and, and put in my mindset to, to have that, you know, to, for next season when I play, I do those things instinctively without thinking. And, uh, and that's going to that's gonna help, help my game a lot. And, um, you know, as I said, I'm, just, I'm really excited for this offseason to have a good long offseason where I can put in the work. And, and, uh, and refresh everything and, and come back next season. As KP puts it, the initial physical transformation he had last season, the start of last season with the Mavericks, he mentioned in the bubble as well, it was actually more of a detriment to him in that he felt bigger and bulkier, but he didn't feel like he was fluid in his movements. His shot felt very unfluid, unnatural to him. And it was actually, bubble KP was much closer to his New York Knicks 
playing weight days. And with that being the case, you saw how he could be his most effective. The trade-off of that is that while he was still at that closer weight this year, the agility and movement wasn't right because of the previous knee surgery, the meniscus in the off season and how closely that lined up. So it's a trade off here. I think for KP, as always, I said it a moment ago, great perspective, great insight. I question not his commitment or his heart to this. I just wonder if physically his body is going to be able to hold up really ever for the course of an 82 game season plus a postseason. Because you can, you can be strategic and rest him and work around things, but ultimately he's going to have to go out there. And is he going to be able to avoid the ankle injury, the knee injury, the back, the shoulder, whatever. And I don't even think there was an example of a shoulder. I'm just throwing other things out there. Lower body injuries, particularly with KP, has been the story. So will he ever be able to be reliable in that role for Dallas? I want to take this season with a grain of salt. But given everything else we know, it's not so much a grain of salt. It might be closer to a pound of salt. Wait, that actually goes to the opposite of what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say I'm taking it more seriously. So an ounce of salt, a pound of salt means I take it very, what, whatever, I digress. The point being, I have questions, but I am still hopeful that he can reach closer to the form we saw pre at least pre bubble in january to march prior to the meniscus tear Whew, okay now we head into some interesting territory here because donnie nelson gave some interesting answers in his exit interview some rather contentious answers definitely things that feel potentially just detached from reality I think with Donnie Nelson, you'll play your cards close to your vest. I get that. But it's a lot of salesman speak, and it's a lot of the same crap we hear year after year after year after year after year. And what he says and what he does does not often line up as it, as it relates to free agency in particular. I'll play the clip first, and then we'll get into what kind of breakdown and analysis I have to offer from there. Yeah, you know, um, it depends. Obviously, it takes two to tango. And so I think that's what um, in the next, you know, couple of days and we have a chance to, um, you know, visit with uh, with Rick and, you know, see we like a lot of the pieces that we have, Tim. We, we think that we're uh, going in the right direction. This was another uh, step, although you know, right now, today, as we sit here, we're, you know, really disappointed. Um, you know, uh, the good news is that we've got some really good, nice young pieces that fit together. Um, and then, of course, we've got to, um, you know, add to that, which is uh, our priority. So Donnie Nelson basically says that we like our team. We've got some good young pieces. I think this is a bit misguided, a bit of a failed assessment because the Mavericks are not that young of a team. Yes, you have 22 year old Luca. Yes, you have KP, that's 25. But a lot of your guys on the team are not young. Now you could talk about as it relates to playoff experience, but it's not the same as saying that they're a young team. They're not the Oklahoma City Thunder or a team like that that's on an upward swing and hey man just look out in a couple years we got Luca, so maybe it'll only be like a year i don't think you can say that at this point because you got a lot of guys that are in their late 20s certainly not young pups guys that have been in the league four five six seven eight years and then some so the fact that and you played boban who's in his 30s 31 minutes in a crucial game seven that you had to have after playing him 20 something minutes in game six, after playing him 19 minutes, I think it was in game five. Like as much as you want to talk about it being a youth movement and things like that, your assessment of, oh, we got a lot of young pieces that fit nicely together. You have a bunch of decent players who, if they overachieve, yes, they can beat a lot of really good teams. 
what you shouldn't set the expectation as overachieve. Your expectation should be to build the best roster you can to alleviate the burden on Luca, on KP, on other guys like that. Like it shouldn't be, hey, I gotta go out there and I gotta drop 35, get 14 assists and nine rebounds for us to have a chance to win a game. Yeah, as you guys know, we'll uh, be aggressive in the off season. Um, it's, uh, it's a big summer for us. We're um, looking forward to, um, you know, putting the, the other building blocks in place. We look internally first, as we always do. And um, we like a lot of the things that we've, uh, we've seen. Uh, we think as a young team, we've kind of uh, taken the, the next step. Obviously, um, we ran into a little bit of a veteran a buzzsaw, you know, some of, some of um, guys that we were, you know, slapping up against took it to a different level. And, um, but, you know, as we you know, try to, you know, figure out, you know, uh, again, the, the pieces to augment uh, our situation, we'll, um, you know, meet with uh, Rick, Mark, obviously the staff in the next um, couple of days and um, hit the ground running in Chicago. You look at Luca and just the amazing year he had. And, um, you know, here's a guy that thinks that, um, you know, he can win every possession of every, uh, every, every game. I mean, and um, his numbers are unique. Um, I think part of his maturity is, again, knowing um, you know, and knowing how to balance, you know, those, all those kill shots, you know, with, um, you know, involving teammates, you know, at the right time. That's just part of the maturity process. And I think um, as we move forward that you'll see, I think, more of an inclusive effort um, overall on those fronts. I do know that um, their, you know, supposed Riff, tiff, whatever you want to call it, is way overblown. Both those guys want to uh, win, um, and I think uh, as you know, time goes by that it's not just KP, but it's you know Timmy, it's other players. I think you'll see a settling down and a balancing of um, uh, Luca's repertoire, and I think not only you know obviously can he put up you know big numbers. Um, but I think you'll see those assists start popping up uh, as well and, you know, involving more and more of his teammates. That's just part of, in my opinion, um, you know, a young 22-year-old superstar um, learning how to win and using all of the chess pieces on the table. Um, I think that's just part of his maturity process. <laughs> Okay, let's dive into this. Donnie Nelson addressing the chemistry between Luca and KP and their future together made a really odd statement and he built on it. It's not just like he said something in passing and moved on. He, he stayed there a while. He made a nice little home. He built a little, a little fort. I, I don't know where I'm going with this analogy, but he says, and I'm going to read it back again because it, it, the quote itself is key, and I want to make sure I'm representing it properly. Here's a guy, Luca, that thinks he can win every possession of every game. I, I mean, if you're talking about scoring or assisting, yeah, sure, I think that's true. His numbers are unique. I think part of his maturity is again knowing how to balance those kill shots with involving his teammates at the right time. Luca scored or assisted on 77 of his team's points in game seven. I don't know what you're trying to get at with that. He continues. That's just part of the maturity process. I think as we move forward, you'll see more of an inclusive effort overall on those fronts. I do know that their support, riff, tiff, whatever you want to call it, is way overblown. Both those guys want to win. 
so the implication of what he's saying, I I'll tell you this right now, how I process this entire quote is this. That's probably loud as shit in the microphone, sorry. That That's what I feel about that quote. There's no way he's this detached from reality. There's none, no way, no way. Donnie saw Dirk, helped discover Dirk and get him to Dallas. He was instrumental in Steve Nash, and he was there pounding the table for Giannis Antetokounmpo when Mark said no. So that's four MVPs right there, like awards, two for Nash, one Dirk, one Giannis, that Donnie saw, and these were not obvious answers. These were not a LeBron James type talent coming out that everybody and their mother was pointing at him and going, that's the next one. No, Donnie has an idea of what he's doing, and Luca will probably win an MVP at some point too, maybe multiple, and so that'll be another one to his credit. He's not this dense. He's not over here believing Luca's not in getting his teammates involved because Luca had 14 assists in game seven. He averaged near triple double. He averaged like, what, eight, nine assists a game this year? In game seven, 14 assists in a game in which his teammates shot five of what was it, 23 or 25 from three? That's, a, that's insane to have that kind of production. There's no way. He doesn't think Luca knows how to get his teammates involved. Luca was passing and creating there in the fourth quarter. Now you can say, hey, you got to cater. If you want to look at it and say that maybe he's trying to really drive it back towards the KP thing of like, you got to know how to get that guy going. Luca set up KP several times in the fourth quarter, and KP, in one instance, Luca crosses over Batum at the top of the key kicks it to a wide open KP for three, and KP immediately swings it to Tim Hardaway Jr. around the arc, who yes, Hardaway had been hot at times. That was game six, not game seven. Hardaway had been hot as hell through three quarters, and he missed that look, but it's still a situation where Luca got him the look. Luca got KP the look, and KP declined it. So you can't look at one, wait, you can't look at one hand and say, KP was hampered with injuries in the short offseason and the condensed schedule, and he wasn't himself out there, but at the same time, Luca's got to do a better job of it. Dude, KP, for the first four games of this series, barely left the corner. He stood as a statue out there, and Luca still got him looks, key looks. KP's big three, the biggest shot of his season, the biggest shot, arguably, of the Mavericks season, as Rick Carlisle called it. When he hit that corner three, in game five to put them up 10 with just over two minutes to play. Luca knows how to move the ball. He knows how to get his teammates involved. This notion that he's immature in that regard and doesn't know how to keep his teammates involved is absurd. On face value, it's absurd. If you wanna say, hey, he's got, I, I think, here's, here's what I think. I said it before, I stand by it. I don't think Donnie is this dense. I think Donnie has a lot of sales speak, and I think he's a guy who says, look, there's a lot of criticism right now on KP, and regardless of what we're looking to do this summer, whether it's move KP or stick with KP, it's not in our best interest or his best interest for him to be embroiled in all of this. So I will take some of that heat because I, I will be critical in this case of Luca, and to be critical of Luca in a series in which he averaged 37 points and, you know, had, I don't know how many rebounds he had, but it was still a situation where Luca every game was looking to get his teammates involved. The only game in which he said, I shot too much in the fourth quarter was game five. And yeah, that, that's really the only time you look at it and say he was forcing things a little bit and it just wasn't dropping. But even then, okay, 37 shots, I get it. But at the same time, the guy was kicking out a lot to his teammates for wide open looks and they just weren't knocking them down, whether it was Hardaway, whether it was Porzingis, whether it was Dorian Vinny Smith, Maxi Klebo, whatever. He got them the looks, they just didn't finish them. So this notion of that is absurd and I think this is Donnie trying to take some of that heat off of KP and say, look, Luca, part of the territory of being the face of the franchise is you gotta be able to take the heat even when you don't deserve it. 
Luka does that, he already knows that. Luka will go out there, have a 46 point game, and then come into the post game press conference and immediately say, I played terrible. I missed too many shots, even though he shot like 46% from the field. I missed too many shots. I played terrible. I didn't score well in the fourth quarter. You know, whatever. He'll find ways to put that on him. And I think this is Donnie leaning into that as well and saying, by virtue of me making these comments, I will take that heat as well. And that keeps it off of KP, which again, if they're trying to mend this relationship with KP that some reports from ESPN and I think the Dallas Morning News are saying are a little bit fractured right now, it makes sense to try to take that heat off it. Because KP knows, everybody in that locker room knows that there's no way you could lay this at Luca's feet beyond like a tepid like, hey, in an ideal scenario, yeah, you want to get him a little bit more involved. But we know what the reality was. We know what KP looked like this year and what he was and was not capable of this year. So they know it. Donnie knows it. It's just a matter of if we can get any of the heat off of you, we think you'll see that, you'll appreciate that, and it'll make things a little easier for both parties. That's what I take away from this. I, I know it's easy to get heated seeing it, and I was in disbelief hearing it. I read the quote, and I thought, there's no way it could be that bad. And then I watched the clip, and I was like, that's not good. <laughs> but the more I process it now, even as I'm giving my thoughts here, the more I think, like, Donnie's not dense. He knows what he's talking about in this regard. That doesn't mean that what he's saying is genuine or accurate it's a matter of deflecting and managing that perception a little bit because luca can take the heat luca's about to get a 200 million dollar deal do you think luca's gonna have his stock or his perception around the league hurt by donnie nelson saying this hell no hell no he's trying to get heat off of kp and he's giving general sales speak where he wants it to sound like, hey man, everybody's got to learn and keep growing. We don't want to say Luca's a finished product and we don't want to make it sound like we're not willing to be critical of our golden boy, our wonder boy, or anything like that. I get that, but it, it's still, by itself and without that context, it's a very head-scratching comment. And the fact that he keeps building on it is crazy. Here's perception as well. Roll back to Donnie Nelson talking about the offseason, dating back, this is 2011, 2013, 2014, and this year. 2011, quote, we're positioning ourselves to be very aggressive in the market next year. 2013, Mavs president and GM Donnie Nelson, quote, we'll be opportunistic. We're going to be very aggressive. 2014, Donnie Nelson, quote, will be aggressive whether it's free agency or draft to put the best possible product on the floor next year. An hour ago, this is from yesterday when he said this during the X, uh, the X interviews. Quote, as you guys know, we'll be aggressive in the off season. It's a big summer for us. How did 2011's off season go? How about 2012, which you referenced in your quote as well? How about 2013, how about 2014? 2015 was the DeAndre Jordan fiasco. I guess I can't put that entirely at your feet, but that's what that was. 2016, we got Harrison Barnes. 2017, yeah, you see where this game is going. Not good, not good. He's sales speak, he says the same thing year after year, but the actions are gonna speak louder than words. His talent assessment, I think, is good in terms of prospects, particularly European prospects, or in Nash's case, obviously, he was in Phoenix as a rookie, but uh, it's a Canadian player. Granted, he played at Santa Clara. But, yeah, his, his evaluation is good of talent. And seeing hidden talent in that regard, too. So I don't think he's this dense. I think this is just a matter of more sales speak and trying to keep heat off of KP by putting it instead on himself and on Luka, who are both insulated and better equipped to deal with it. But that's just my take. So these were my thoughts from the Mavericks exit interviews. These were my biggest takeaways. 
We talked about a number of things here, including Tim Hardaway Jr. and his desire to stay in Dallas, calling it home. We talked about Luka Doncic playing for Slovenia this summer, his max contract, his super max contract of $200 million, which he intends to sign this summer, laughing about it very, uh, you know, very excited. You could tell as he's just kind of snickering to himself about the idea that he's going to be signing that contract this summer. Uh, talks about that, talks as well about how he needs to improve his fit with KP. Rick Carlisle talking about KP's growth and evolution and how he needs to fit into things moving forward. Their intention to be around the Slovenian national team as well with Luka and helping him prepare as he's now going to have no offseason really to speak of. Uh, and then Donnie Nelson making more questionable talent assessments as he talks about a chessboard and things like that, like Luca learning how to utilize the pieces on the chessboard. The problem is you don't really have, I'm, and I'm not a chess player, so I'm gonna mess up this analogy. You're either playing with an incomplete set or you're playing with a lot of pawns and not a lot of like the knights or bishops or anything like that. Your actual assessment of your roster is questionable. You have good pieces. The problem is you don't have the better pieces that complement them. You have like one of the absolute best pieces you could possibly have in Luka, and then you just have a mixture of okay or good but not great pieces. You need some balance in that mid-range. You need, whether it's KP playing at least that next step down, or it's getting other talent in here that can take that burden off. If KP plays to what you saw even between January and March or the bubble KP, if he can play to that level and be some reliable form of consistent with regard to his health, then you only need one more guy. Realistically, you only need one more big piece. If you don't think KP can do that, then you need two or depending on how you shop, three other guys. So there's a lot a lot to consider and Donnie pointing back to oh we're always going to try to be very aggressive and we're going to start that search by looking in house as we always do the problem is you don't ever look outside of your house it's like you got burned the past couple of years it's like you got burned so many times chasing a big fish that now you're almost you're almost gun shy you're almost like eh, we like our guys let's just try and run it back and hope that they can keep growing and taking steps forward Rick Carlisle even talked at one point, and I didn't have the clip here, he even talked at one point about Maxi Kleba, and he had a very good season, he said, but he was unable to have a great season because he dealt with a lot of nagging health injuries, be it uh, his back at times or his ankle, and he's a very unique, very talented player, but I would still caution that I don't know that Maxi can reach much higher. He's a versatile defender and a guy that shot more than 40% from three this year. So the odds of him taking yet another step forward, particularly when he's showing wear on that Achilles, is not good, not, not good. So you need to be self-aware in these assessments of, we have good guys and they're playing good. In fact, they're playing at a higher level than they almost have any business, thanks to the virtue of playing with Luka Doncic. But we need to still be aware that we need to look outside of our own house to make this team better and not just the draft of course you need to take the draft seriously too and some of the guys you've picked up even though there are better options that you passed on i still like some of these guys that you have i still think josh green has a nice future i still think tyrell terry has a nice future i think a lot of these guys have a good future as role players for you the problem is they're that role players you need you need actual significant players guys who on a given night could step up and be that number two option or a number three option for you. But again, I, I got back into another little ramble here. Those are my takeaways from the exit interviews for the Dallas Mavericks. It's going to be a hell of an off season. It is crucial for them to get this right. But as the news comes out, I will do more of these videos, breaking it down and analyzing it. And we will see more of what this team has to offer as we move into year four of Luka Doncic, and I would say year two of open window as far as this team being serious and not just happy about the playoffs, but rather trying to do 
Like this video, drop a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. Listen. From prospect to legend.